Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, some of the highest river levels on the Mississippi since the 1927 flood have shut down casinos at Tunica and will cause backwater flooding in the South Delta. Smithville, Mississippi starts to recover from its major tornado. Mississippi Women for Agriculture gets off to a fast start. In the markets, beef demand is being hurt by high gasoline prices. As cotton futures skid big time, OA Cleveland has analysis. In the feature segment, the Howard 4-H Therapeutic Riding and Activity Center at West Point, Mississippi. The horseback therapy program is proving beneficial to its riders. In 2003, Elizabeth Howard started riding with us and her parents saw her close her right hand for the first time in her life on the back of the horse by clamping the saddle horn. And the next week, the dad came and said, I want my child to ride more. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. While the eastern part of Mississippi digs out from tornado damage, the west side of the state is preparing for the extremely high backwater flooding from the Mississippi River. Leighton, flooding was the topic of conversation at Friday's Delta Council's annual meeting in Cleveland. The main levees along the Mississippi River are expected to hold. Backwater flooding occurs, however, when the Mississippi River backs up into the rivers that flow into it. The crest is expected in the Vicksburg area around May 18th. An estimated 1,200 people showed up Wednesday for a public meeting in Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Mississippi Levee Board said 200,000 acres of wildlife habitat and 175,000 cropland acres could be flooded in the South Delta. That's 585 square miles or an area bigger than Lee County where Tupelo is located. The area could be even bigger. The biggest concern is about whether the, it's called the Yazoo Backwater Levee. It doesn't prevent backwater flooding for the Mississippi River, but it keeps it from being much worse than if it wasn't there at all. The water is expected to be high, actually high enough to go over the top of this levee on Sunday, May 15th. It's designed to allow this, but the flowing water could cause the Yazoo Backwater Levee to fail, flooding even more acres. Uh, even if that levee failed while it was being overtop, it would still take about four or five days to get up to Rolling Fork, a very slow flood. So the residents would have plenty of time to move north uh, to get out of harm's way. Farmer Keith Killebrew of Yazoo County is experiencing his first big backwater flood. He's building a levee to protect part of his operation, but it won't be enough if the water gets really high. He has crop insurance, but the flood water has already gotten what's up. Here on this farm, we have cotton, corn, uh, cotton soybeans, and uh, rice. We have our cotton, it's already a stand, it's about three weeks old. Uh, our soybeans are about two weeks old. And we hadn't got a chance to plant our rice yet, but you know, thank goodness we hadn't, we hadn't done that already. We'll have more from the Rolling Fork meeting on next week's Farm Week. The death toll from the April 27th tornadoes in Mississippi increased by one to 36 on Wednesday as another resident of Smithville died from her tornado-caused injuries in the hospital. The Mississippi Emergency Management Agency says the residents in 11 Mississippi counties who suffered damages from either the tornadoes or the April 15th flash flooding are urged to apply for federal disaster assistance. You can call 800-621-3362 or go to the FEMA website. We will have that contact information on our FarmWeek MSUCares.com website. Mississippi State University Extension Service employees have been on the front line of relief efforts following the April 27th tornadoes. As you heard a moment ago, the death toll is now 15 in Smithville, southeast of Tupelo. It's the single most devastated area in the state. The MSU Extension Service has played a key role in Monroe County in the week following the tragedy. In Smithville, Mississippi, the Blue Water Towers are still standing, but not much else. 
Based on the tremendous damage here, the National Weather Service classified the April 27th tornado in northern Monroe County an EF5. EF5 tornadoes have wind speeds exceeding 200 miles per hour and leave a path of total destruction. This is what's left of the Smithville Town Hall on Highway 25. The post office was also demolished. A spray-painted message on a brick wall that's still standing tells the residents to pick up mail at Amory. Soon after the tornado, the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency and the Sheriff's Department set up their mobile headquarters in the parking lot of the Piggly Wiggly grocery store, which was badly damaged but still standing. Governor Haley Barber toured Smithville two days after the tornado and told an outdoor news conference this is as bad as it gets. A couple of blocks south at an undamaged furniture warehouse, the Mississippi State University Extension Service was working with the Monroe County Emergency Management Agency to set up a distribution point for relief supplies. This is the main uh, uh, long-term storage type uh, supply warehouse here. Of course, as you can see in the background, is a, a furniture manufacturing facility here. Uh, and they're loading furniture on uh, trucks as we speak to clear out more room for uh, possible, you know, supplies that could come later on. Area Extension Agronomy Agent Charlie Stokes and County Extension Director B.J. McClinton were soon busy unloading additional pallets of drinking water from large trailers. The water was stored with the other commodities already in the warehouse. To speed the distribution work, the nearby MSU North Mississippi Research and Extension Center in Verona loaned a forklift to Smithville. It was delivered two days after this storm on a flatbed trailer. The forklift will be used by extension personnel and others staffing the warehouse. Operating a supply distribution point is only part of the extension services mission in Monroe and other counties during emergency situations. Primary role is to um, do livestock recovery, um, fencing, um, anything as far as uh, farmers. Our primary role and then our secondary role is to do the allocation and storage of commodities, foodstuffs, not, and bulk items and have those on hand for long-term storage and long-term um, distribution for the population. The Extension Service will continue its important role in the recovery efforts in Monroe and other counties as long as needed by local emergency management. The Smithville storm was the first EF5 tornado to be recorded in the state since 1966. From Smithville, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. Mississippi's newest agricultural support group recently celebrated its birthday. Mississippi Women for Agriculture grew out of the Mississippi Women in Agriculture program operated by Mississippi State University's Extension Service. The MWA held its first official meeting at Mississippi State University recently. The organization wants to help women learn business skills and network together as they support Mississippi agriculture. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports from Mississippi State University. Women involved in Mississippi's agriculture industry were recently informed of a pleasant outlook for the future. Becky Smith, MSU Assistant Research Professor for the College of Business, describes what was discussed at the Mississippi Women for Agriculture Conference. We talked about gross domestic product and the national income and the rebound that we've seen. Gross domestic product is a broad measure of national income. So we're back at our 3.1% growth and that's expected. The outlook is relatively positive. Slow growth, but yet it is improving. So I really enjoyed getting to speak. You never know what you're going to get when you go into a room and these women were dynamic and they were um, really participatory. They had really good, relevant questions. Smith says it's important that women stay updated on how the economy affects their businesses or operations. Her quarterly publication, Economy Watch, has information about economic conditions and consumer confidence in the state. Gloria Sturdivant with Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative explains a new effort to reach rural women. Well, it's an initiative to create a non additional opportunity for women in rural communities. We go out and we meet with them and we talk to them about, um, you know, economic opportunity and how they can create that from, from whatever they have. How they could get, get back into farming to create um, 
supplement income for, for themselves and their families. Another part of what I do is I, you know, I research to find out what's the latest information, what's the latest funding, what, you know, so they're, they're very encouraged because there are so many women out there that are doing this type of thing. Sturdivant says right now the targeted counties for the program include Washington, Yazoo, Humphreys, Holmes, and Bolivar. The Women for Agriculture Conference was held at the MSU Boss Extension Center. From Mississippi State University, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. And Amy, we'll be back next week with more on the flooding situation in the Mississippi Delta. We might also tell viewers that the MSUcares.com website, where Farm Week's located, has a lot of links on helping you with this. There are even some links on telling you how to sandbag and how to build something like that. Uh, it's a Corps of Engineers link, but we have a link to that. Go to MSUcares.com and uh, you'll see the link for uh, disaster and for flooding type information. Well, in our feature segment today, the Elizabeth Howard Therapeutic 4-H Writing Center at West Point, Mississippi is making a big difference in the lives of the area's young people, regardless of whether they ride. Time now for the markets with Layton. Layton, cotton's been on some changes in the last few weeks. That's right. In fact, artists, a uh, big sell-off in cotton at midweek. We'll have some analysis in just a moment. Meanwhile, at the same time, rallies were seen in corn based on a rumor of more Chinese sales. But some analysts think high gasoline prices are hurting the beef sector. Falling prices have been the story for cotton, especially this week. Analysts think the dip is related to disappointing data about the U.S. economy, as well as some concerns over future sales to China. MSU Professor Emeritus Dr. O.A. Cleveland discussed his view of the cotton market Thursday morning. What's put the pressure on the cotton market this week? Well, a couple of things late and one as we have seen some deliveries made uh, against the futures contract, nothing that should be surprising, but we've also seen the, Jap the uh, Japanese, the Chinese out on holiday and of course with them being the major player and with them not in the market uh, buying, then the market just does tend to float a little bit lower. It's fairly typical. Uh, we've been on a very good run. The run is still there, we, we, which we, we're, not, we're not taking a dive from here, but uh, it was time to slow things down. We've moved uh, the May contract has now uh, is, is set up to expire. Uh, so July is the lead contract, and we've got to connect July and the December contract. We've got to get a meeting of the minds there, and what's been happening is that July has been coming down to December rather than December coming up. And I think we'll continue to see that in December at $1.30, $1.35, or $1.25. Anywhere from $1.20 to $1.35, we should not be surprised to see December trade there. I think it's got a good life there. Would you expect cotton to become a weather market at some point here? A uh, lot of emphasis on weather this e spring. E exactly. Uh, West Texas is in, the, is in the midst of a hundred year drought. Uh, here in the Delta we were talking about, or uh, the Mississippi River, Mississippi River Delta states, we were talking about a 50 year flood situation, but now it's developing to be a 75 to 100 year flood situation. So we've got uh, in West Texas, there is certainly time to bring some moisture in, but uh, it's getting awful late for, 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 for the dry land cotton. Even if they got a rain, it still would be very problem problematic throughout the year without more moisture. I think what we've got to continue to look at is this, these, uh, these acres most likely will decline. Planting acres might be there but we bring in the insurance format and then we begin to see harvested acres will be down considerably. Like cotton most other commodities also struggle this week. Corn was the exception however. Rallies were the story at the market close as of Wednesday. DTN says it was due to news concerning business out of China. The first shipment of corn was loaded from a Chinese purchase reported months ago. And there was a rumor in the market that more Chinese corn sales could develop. Time to look at the weekly trivia quiz here on Farm Week. How many chickens do you need in order to have a real flock? Is the answer one or two or three or more than three chickens? I'll tell you a bit later. We're going to pause now for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar in the second part of the markets. Leighton Span reports Fed cattle prices have pulled back. In the feature segment today, the Howard Therapeutic Riding and Activity Center at West Point, Mississippi. These horses really bring out the best in their young riders. Committed, 
Absolutely. People rely on me. I don't take that lightly. Sure, sometimes we get out of sync and things feel forced. That's when the commitment kicks in. You buckle down, hammer it out, and keep it together for everybody involved. So, yeah, I'm completely committed to my marriage. Till death do us part. Commit to your marriage. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. The Union County Workshop Series on small-scale agriculture continues Monday night. Agritourism and farm recreation opportunities is on the agenda. It takes place Monday, May 9th at the Union County Fairgrounds in New Albany. It gets underway at 6 p.m. Registration fee is $5. Two grazing schools were set for Mississippi livestock farmers. Participants will learn about forage and grazing management. There will also be demonstrations of fencing and hay management as well. The first takes place Thursday, May 26th. The cost is $20 and that includes lunch. The location is the Lincoln County Multipurpose Center at Brookhaven, Mississippi. The second spring grazing school is a week later on Thursday, June 2nd. It takes place at the Prairie Research Unit of Mississippi State University. That's located west of Aberdeen at Prairie. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this Farm Week snapshot. After a huge run in March and April, analysts note that the Fed cattle market has been pulling back a little. In recent media appearances, DTN analyst Darren Newsom has said it all goes back to rising gasoline prices. With gasoline going so high, we're seeing you know, discretionary spending on things like beef and so on, demands getting hurt. And so the threat is and the possibility is that we have seen an earlier than normal top in the cash cattle market, in the beef market, because of the fact people just aren't going to be spending the money because of the, of the gasoline price. And if that lasts you know, through May and possibly into June, that's just going to pressure the cattle market more. So this buildup that we normally see going into grilling season may have already occurred and that could start to turn the market lower, possibly faster than we normally see. Wrapping up our markets now, here's a look at which answer is correct for trivia. This week it is C. You need three chickens in order to have a real flock. Last fall, a new youth center opened at West Point, Mississippi. The Elizabeth Howard 4-H Therapeutic Riding and Activity Center is the home of a therapy program that is making a big difference in the lives of disabled young people. The center is also becoming the site of many Mississippi State University Extension Service events. Farm Week's Amy Taylor first brought us this story last November. New opportunities for recreation, educational programs, and training courses are available following the creation of the Elizabeth A. Howard 4-H Therapeutic Riding and Activity Center. Mississippi State University Extension's 4-H Therapeutic Riding Program helps young people and adults with disabilities and is one of many programs to use the facility. Mary Riley, Extension 4-H Therapeutic Riding Coordinator, explains the development of the arena, which involves a young rider with cerebral palsy. In 2003, Elizabeth Howard started riding with us, and her parents saw her close her right hand for the first time in her life on the back of the horse by clamping the saddle horn. And the next week, the dad came and said, I want my child to ride more. So Elizabeth's parents donated funding to help build the arena located on about 60 acres in West Point. The land had already been donated to Mississippi 4-H Foundation by Bryan Farms and Jimmy Bryan in 2000. Riley explains how the riding program helps those with physical, mental, emotional, or behavioral disabilities. We have two different programs going on. One is hippotherapy, which is using the horse with a health professional, occupational therapist, speech therapist, or physical therapist, and the instructor. And the therapist is doing exactly what they would, do, would be doing in the clinic, but they're using the horse as a piece of equipment. The horse walks identically to the human. The pelvis is, only, is offset of 90 degrees. Therefore, it's feeding the brain of a person 
that has a mobility impairment as if they are in a normal walking gait. And that from the medical standpoint is what is so critical and so exciting about therapeutic riding that therapists, doctors have not been able to simulate with that with a piece of equipment. The other program is therapeutic riding, which does not directly involve the therapist a patient is already seeing, but does expand on the patient's current exercises. What we do is find out what professionals they are working with if it's a special education teacher, find out are they working on math, reading, and then we translate what they're working on out here into the arena. Instructors can accomplish that by incorporating items like chalkboards, rubber rings, and other objects into the lesson. Instructor Hannah Miller says the activities provide good stimulation for the riders. It just gives life to the lesson, gets something different every day. They can do poles or scavenger hunts or um, playing with the rings on the poles and it's just something to keep them. We also do glitter and face paint on the horses um, just to get them engaged and keep them interested each week. Miller says it's also the bond between horse and rider that makes the program effective. She claims becoming a therapeutic riding instructor was no easy task. It was a lot of work. Um, I had to do several tests and then we had a, a a week where we did workshops and we got actual, our actual certification. The test involved a riding test where we actually had to ride and do a certain pattern and then we also had to teach an actual lesson and they looked at our teaching styles and then of course there was online tests. You also have to do 25 hours of volunteer work as well as um, the actual five-day workshop and training. Miller says she's glad to be part of the program because it relates to her career aspirations in occupational or physical therapy. In addition to therapeutic riding, the facility is available for many other activities. MSU Extension Clay County Director Donna Clyte describes other uses for the riding center. We will also be able to offer activities to 4-H youth in activities that they can prepare for their 4-H competitions. We will be able to use the facility, uh, other parts of this property for a, an ASI certified training center for uh, ATV safety. We also have acreage that will allow 4-H uh, shooting sports practice in archery and things of that nature. We, of course, we won't be coming out here with shotguns and rifles with horses and things, but we will be able to offer uh, activities such as archery practice and preparing for competitions in 4-H. We're very excited that we're actually getting to begin to use the facility. We will have some environmental education facilities set up so that we can take school youth and other groups out on walking trails, help them identify plants and animals and all different types of things on the walking and riding trails. In addition, Clyte says the arena will be able to host the annual safety day programs that reach about five to six hundred youth. Larry Alexander, ATV safety rider course coordinator, talks about the safety training at the facility. After they get familiar with their machine, we do promote the use of reading the uh, owner's manual to become even more familiar with the machine. After that, we get into the actual riding of the, uh, of the ATV. There are 16 lessons that are involved in the rider course, and once they go through uh, those 16 lessons, they're pretty much familiar with all of the riding strategies that they may encounter in a real uh, live ride that they may encounter back at home or some other place. So it's a very intense training. Uh, and we don't spend a lot of time as a talking head. This is an opportunity for them to be on the machine. Alexander says adults can also take the course. In addition to holding MSU extension and 4-H activities, the Riding Center collaborates with the City of West Point and Clay County to allow non-extension activities. Donna Clyte explains what to do to apply for non-extension use of the property. Any group that is n not extension based or 4-H youth group would need to contact the Clay County Extension Office for information and paperwork on how to apply to use the facilities. 
However, we do want people to understand that, that the facilities will be extensively in use and may already be booked. Clyde says the facility offers exciting opportunities for Extension and 4-H to carry out the mission of serving the community through education, research, youth development, and safety training. Those involved in Mississippi State University Extension and 4-H programs have lots to look forward to following the establishment of the Elizabeth A. Howard 4-H Therapeutic Writing and Activity Center. From West Point, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. And you can watch this story again on our Farm Week website, farmweek.msucares.com. We will have links to get you in touch with therapeutic riding programs in Mississippi. There are others than just the one at West Point. That's farmweek.msucares.com. We also want to remind you that as far as flooding or tornado information, that's also available on the farmweek.msucares.com website. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our show next week, the flooding threat continues. We will have much more from the Rolling Fork meeting on Mississippi Delta flooding. In the feature segment, Russ and Barbara Ford, the Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Tree Farmers of the Year. Tree farming is Russ Ford's job, his only job. In Southern Gardening, Delphinium, there are more than 300 species of this member of the buttercup family. If you'd like further information on Farm Week's story or want to suggest a story to us, get in touch. Our address, Farm Week, Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi, 39762. That's Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi, 39762. Our telephone number is 662-325-2262. You can also contact us through your Mississippi State University Extension Service Office. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week.